Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of 6837. Today we're going to continue in our grab bag of graphics topics at the end of this course by talking about image processing. Now unlike many of the graphics topics that we've talked about in 6837, image processing stands out because in some sense it's an a posteriori way to edit an image rather than a way to produce one from scratch. So image processing algorithms show up all over the place from computational photography, like all those cool Instagram filters and Snapchat and whatever it is that you guys use these days, uh, to just post-processing rendered content before it's composited together into the frames of a film. So I think it's important to acknowledge this area and give you some idea of the flavor of the kind of computations that go on in typical image processing algorithms. So unlike many of our past lectures, in fact, the vast majority of our past lectures in this course, today we're gonna to go back to basically all two-dimensional mathematics. So the basics of image processing, unlike most of the 3D rendering techniques that we've covered in this course, really disregards the 3D content of an image. This is not universally true, by the way, but often is and instead just applies directly to the grid of pixel values that we've already produced. But that's not to say that image processing is only relevant to either photographs or videos or, you know, two-dimensional animation, but rather uh, a very common thing to do, even in real-time systems like gaming, is actually to apply image processing filters as the very last step before rendering an image on the screen. And this can take care of things like visual balance and contrast, or even blurring out the background to fake some kind of a depth of field effect, uh, which is happening really in screen space rather than in the 3D space where it should be happening. So, Image processing is this incredibly important area, and in fact, at MIT, we offer many different courses in this domain. Today, I'm just gonna give you some idea of the types of algorithms that go on in this space and really describe them for you in a computer graphics style uh, or flavor here. So to get started here, we have to define our enemy here and, and understand the data that it is that we're going to work with, namely images. Now, Almost all of 6837 has dealt with images in some fashion, either producing them or describing the content in an image you're about to uh, render or, or what have you. But at the end of the day, the way that we store an image is relatively simple. It's just a two-dimensional array of pixel values. And that's really what image processing is all about, is taking as input one of these two-dimensional arrays editing it in some fashion, and then outputting another two-dimensional array. Simple enough. Now, mathematically, sometimes it's actually convenient to have a slightly different viewpoint on what it means to do image processing. And that is to think of an image not as a discrete grid of pixels, but rather as a function, oops, I don't know why that happened, f of x comma y. So this is basically disregarding the sampling reconstruction viewpoint that we developed in our anti-aliasing lecture and saying that, well, if I have a really dense image, I can basically think of it as a two-dimensional function that I can differentiate and uh, you know blur out and process in different ways. Now, really, this is just mathematical shorthand. Of course, at the end of the day, in image processing, we really are in the discrete universe we're not in the continuous one, but essentially the, the, the basic idea here is that some intuition from calculus class really can help you out when you're designing image processing techniques. Now in practice, what does this mean? This means that you can kind of choose your poison uh, notationally. You know, you can either sum things up if you're uh, in the discrete side, uh, or if you prefer the uh, continuous viewpoint, then maybe instead of summing you integrate. And what we'll see is that many of the filters that we'll talk about today can be described in either one of these languages pretty much equally well. Um, the distinction between these does become important when we talk, if you talk about advanced topics like total variation filtering, but those aren't gonna come up in today's lecture. So if images are two-dimensional grids of pixel colors, then videos are kind of like three-dimensional objects, right? So they're like tensors or big, cubes worth of values, where maybe uh, 
we can think of two of the axes of our cube as just the position on the computer screen. And now the third axis of the cube is time. And now I think we're used to thinking about this at least intuitively. You know, oftentimes uh, when we process video, we're just processing a sequence of frames one after the next. But this sort of cube, you know, piece of bread viewpoint on what it means to process video can actually be extremely valuable. So for example, if you're trying to track an object that's moving around in a video stream, one typical thing you can do to visualize is actually to look at slices through this cube that go through it um, transverse uh, here to one of the uh, spatial dimensions. And so essentially what you're doing is looking at like one row of your image across all of the different times. Um, and I encourage you to take a video and slice it this way. You'll see that it contains some really interesting information. Now, regardless, when we talk about images or videos, we have to say what's contained in these two uh, or three dimensional arrays. And given the lectures that we've had so far, the typical answer you probably would give is that our arrays contain RGB values. If you remember from our last lecture, essentially we can store these three uh, color values and they can be used to reproduce most of the visual content that we're used to seeing even though really the world is composed of these continuous spectra of light energies. But in fact, it turns out that most common image formats um, don't necessarily just store RGB. You know, so that would be our sort of typical array here. But they actually store along with it a, a fourth value. By the way, I've made a bit of a controversial choice on the slide, which is to put my red, green, and blue in a range from zero to one, but often it's from zero to whatever your maximum integer is. So you just gotta remember what. But in any event, there are some applications, especially in two-dimensional image processing, that begin to suggest that this RGB channels are actually insufficient. And <clears throat> in particular, one of the really important applications that happens a lot in uh, graphics hardware that's attached to video cameras is something called compositing. Here's a slice of a low quality uh, music video you might recognize. Um, and the reason that I uh, grabbed it off of YouTube is that it actually makes the compositing pretty obvious. So here our uh, singer, uh, Rebecca, is singing a song. You know, you can see her outline here. But rather than contain or uh, show the ugly background behind her, uh, we've replaced it with this dramatic sparkly purpley thing. <laughs> and as many of you guys know, the way that this happens in practice is using a technique called compositing. So in compositing, Rebecca here sings in front of a green screen. It's exactly what it sounds like, just a wall painted a bright color green. And then computationally, the software replaces that background with a different color. Now, why am I so confident that this particular music video was composited together? Well, here I've given you a zoom onto her shoulder and take a look, there's this kind of funny white highlight that you can see in the image here. And what's going on is that of course her shoulder is reflecting the green screen behind her, which doesn't really match the shading of the dark room background, uh, which she shows them for the background. And so they don't end up blending together particularly well. I would say this is a pretty low quality compositing job. In any event, more generally, compositing is the uh, technique of combining visual elements from different sources into a single image. And there are so many different reasons why we want to do compositing, right? Green screen effect is one, but there are many others. So another common one might be to combine rendered, comment, uh, rendered content with uh, video content. So maybe I film an actor and I want that actor to interact with a digital character. So I need to composite together the rendered frames of the digital character with the uh, measured frames that have come from the video camera. So compositing is actually so common that many image formats actually don't store images just as RGB, but they actually add a fourth channel. This is called A or alpha. So yeah, the A, I guess I didn't, oh, there it is, yeah. Uh, it's the alpha channel. And essentially you can think of alpha as kind of like transparency. So the basic idea of storing an image as RGBA 
is that the A channel is telling you the fraction that's covered by the foreground, right? So if A is equal to one, then pay attention to that RGB values. And if A is less than one, then I should blend it with the background. And as A approaches zero, I should basically just leave the background there. So that's to say the many common image formats, again, store images with four channels rather than three for red, green, blue, and then alpha, which is some notion of transparency. So what does this mean? Well, if we want to composite together a uh, image built out of all these different parts, so I have a bunch of layers, each of which is an RGBA image, then essentially I have to use some kind of a formula like what I've shown you on the slide here. So for example, maybe I have a foreground color, C sub F, and I have a background color, C sub B, and I want to combine them together at a pixel. One way to do that would be to take alpha times C sub F plus one minus alpha times C sub B and add those two things together. So essentially what's going on here is that this is just a weighted average. You can see that uh, because essentially the alpha value here is taking the role of the weight in the weighted average, right? The bigger alpha is, the more of an effect the foreground color has. And the reason that alpha is not just binary is that we can use it to blend with the background. So maybe if we were a little bit more strategic with Rebecca's uh, 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 compositing job along her shoulder, maybe we would choose an alpha value that was smaller but not zero so that her shoulder kind of blended in with the background more smoothly. Incidentally, this computation has to happen at every single pixel of your image and potentially at every frame of a video sequence. So in other words, we have to do this little linear combination millions and millions and millions of times. So a typical thing to do to shave off computation is maybe in your image format, rather than storing just the foreground color, you instead store the foreground color already multiplied by alpha, because you know you're going to have to do that. Um, this is a technique called pre-multiplied alpha. And it's as simple as that. Essentially, your image stores the uh, alpha scaled foreground rather than the foreground. So what does this allow us to do? So one example is green screen effects, where essentially you have a green screen uh, behind the actor, and then you can use it to composite that actor together with different backgrounds, like, you know, a uh, palm tree or, you know, a blue thing or whatever this thing is on the right. Now, why do we choose the color green? Well, if you think about it, uh, there are not too many humans out there with uh, skin color or hair color that's close to that green shade. Uh, so essentially, it's pretty easy to detect that you should take alpha to zero when you see any colors close to the green color of the green screen. And in fact, green screens aren't the only option, right? So some of these screens are blue, um, or if you specifically know you're going to have a green character, maybe you, you, you choose another one. Uh, and in fact, every once in a while on the news, you can see the green screen gone wrong. So here's a funny little video clip. Let me turn off the audio. So here the uh, newscaster is wearing a green shirt. And so uh, when she gets in front of the green screen, of course, she combines in with the background, which is a bit of a wardrobe malfunction of her own here. So... If you use the green, you know, in some sense, this is one of these uh, instances of, uh, you know, art, uh, what is it, life affecting art, <laughs> you know. Um, if you know you're going to use a green screen, you better choose your outfit accordingly. And in fact, uh, this compositing trick of compositing images together is one of many operations that you can do using that alpha value. This is kind of cool. So. Um, just the same as we talked about doing Boolean algebra with shapes when we talked about ray tracing, uh, there's also an associated algebra with compositing that can like put one shape over another or compute their intersections and so on. Um, and basically all of these uh, operations can be written in terms of uh, the alpha value. So for example, if I want to put A over B, well, what could I do? Maybe I uh, look at the alpha value of A, uh, and if it's equal to one, then I replace the pixel color, and only as that alpha value goes to zero do I use the pixel in the background, right? So that's roughly just the uh, compositing operation that we already described. 
Or maybe I want to take an intersection. So that would be this in operation. One way that I could accomplish that might be to multiply the alphas together from shapes A and B. So anyway, as a fun exercise at home, I'll let you guys derive the different compositing algebra formulas. Uh, basically, you can get each of the effects that you see on the screen here by having one image of the shape underneath, including its alpha, an image of the shape on top, including its alpha, and knowing which operations you're going to carry out. And essentially, all of these different images that you see are just different formulas in terms of those two colors and those two alpha values. Uh, and the kind of nice thing is that these are fuzzy operations, so they allow you to deal with partially transparent uh, images as well. Okay, so really, uh, this, these compositing operations that we're talking about are just simple per pixel operations. And of course, there are many of them out there. Um, so a very typical class of image filters essentially is just dealing with color space. Like maybe I take the RGB color of a pixel and I just map it through three functions, F1, F2, and F3, to change the color of every pixel orthogonally to every other one. Right, so for example, that sepia tone filter that you might have on your Instagram is a nice example where you're just mapping all the colors in the image to a different set of colors one by one. There's no relationship between different pixels. These are great examples of operations that can be implemented in a SIMD fashion. Remember, this means single instruction, multiple data. The point here being that there's a ton of data, which is just the RGB of every single pixel in your image, and every single one has to be run through the same, oops, the same functions, F1, F2, and F3. So essentially, you're just applying the same sledgehammer over and over again to lots of different pieces of data. And this is really a species of computation that is well suited for parallel uh, computation on your graphics card. And there are many color space operations out there uh, that are motivating this sort of mathematics. So, for example, if I want to adjust the brightness of a photograph, maybe that's as simple as taking the pixel colors and multiplying them by a uh, constant. Or if I want to increase the uh, contrast in a photograph, that can actually be understood as a per pixel operation as well. Now, this one's a little bit trickier to define. But essentially, one thing that we can do is actually make this uh, function by hand. So uh, here, uh, I've given you a plot, sort of a histogram of different pixel colors. So like this image contains, you know, some dark pixels and some light pixels. And then one thing you might do is actually design the uh, functions f1, f2, and f3 based on that histogram. So, for example, the plot that I've shown you here takes this uh, range of pixel values and just kind of stretches it out to the range from 0 to 1 so that you're kind of making use of the full range of possible pixel values, which is, in effect, increasing the contrast of the image. It's using uh, the color in a better fashion. You can also do the opposite of that, like desaturate. Uh, one useful formula perceptually uh, converts RGB to grayscale. Notice that uh, there's kind of an interesting ratio of red, green, and blue here, which is typically used to do this conversion. This has to do with the uh, ratio of uh, how much your eye senses these colors and uh, potentially the pattern uh, that they appear on your uh, image sensor. So in any event, all of these different functions that are applied per pixel to an image that like increase the brightness or remap the colors and so on, they're really just functions directly that take in RGB and output another RGB, right? There's not like a notion of grabbing a whole neighborhood of pixels and averaging their color or anything like that. And so here I show you a very typical user interface for this sort of operation where essentially, just like I showed you in a previous slide, what you can do in tools like Photoshop here is uh, open up this particular tool. This is called a histogram. And what it's showing you is it binned all of the different pixel colors from black to white here. 
And the height of this orange function is essentially the number of pixels with that different brightness. So then essentially what you can do is just draw your per pixel function um, by prescribing it using this little curve here, right? So right now it's a diagonal line, which means it's just f of x equals x. But by messing with that function, in effect, you're messing with the shape of the histogram or equivalently the distribution of colors in your uh, image. So I encourage you to do that at home. Now, just for fun, how do you guys think that uh, these functions are represented behind the scenes? Well, of course, the answer, because everything in 6837 fits together, uh, is that these functions are represented using splines, right? So in effect, maybe you draw some funky contrast increasing function here. Uh, then behind the scenes is probably just a cubic or a piecewise cubic uh, being stored. So in any event, these are just some simple uh, per pixel operations that you can implement. Uh, and are often things that get controlled as the very last step of a rendering pipeline to make sure that like the contrast and the visual content of a final image uh, is as visually pleasing as possible. But there are other applications of per pixel filtering as well. So here is a nice example where some more clever filters are needed. So Oftentimes in the image processing literature, especially in computational photography, you see like millions of photographs of churches. Now, you know, it might be that my colleagues in computational photography are just a religious bunch. And uh, of course, I wouldn't want to deny them that. Um, but in fact, there is at least a secondary reason <laughs> why uh, you might want to photograph a church and test out your software there which is that these sorts of photographs contain a massive amount of dynamic range. Now, what does that mean? Well, if I'm taking a photograph of this church scene here, well, in fact, the way that these cathedrals are constructed, uh, you know, to make that kind of cool godlike look, was that you have a ton of light coming in the cathedral all right behind the altar here, right? This is where all the light is coming from. And so what ends up happening is that there's a huge amount of light in this part of the image. And then in other parts of the image, it's relatively dark. And so when I take a photograph of this scene, what ends up happening? Well, remember that I have to choose a shutter speed, like I have to choose how much time my camera is open and my film gets exposed. So uh, typically, it's really, really hard to capture scenes like this because if I leave my camera open long enough to capture the detail of the church, then the light part of the church near the stained glass window is just going to get blown out. It's just going to look like white. This is an issue of dynamic range. So uh, here's another example of an outdoor photograph, like kind of pointed right at the sun. Probably not a great uh, practice uh, in photography, but you know, if that's what you want to photograph, so be it. And here, essentially, we photographed the same scene with different uh, stops on the camera. So in other words, the shutter is open for different amounts of time. And look at what happens. So even when the shutter is open for a really tiny amount of time, that's actually enough to capture the tiny little piece of geometry, which is the sun. And then as it gets open longer, we can capture the darker parts of the scene. So dynamic range is a big issue, and there are many different ways to try and approach it and fix it. If you like this kind of thing, I encourage you to take uh, Fredo's advanced course in computational photography. And it's really a big challenge. I mean, the typical dynamic ranges uh, for different um, display mechanisms and sensing mechanisms is shown here. Now, this is not the dynamic range of like a visual scene, uh, but it's, uh, if you look at the uh, rows beyond the first one, these are just the dynamic range of different media and sensors. So the idea here is that your uh, eye, in a static sense, can uh, see a visual dynamic range of roughly 100 to 1. Um, cameras can detect up to 1,000 to 1 dynamic range in a shot. If you want a really bad dynamic range, if you like print on a piece of matte printer paper, then you can get roughly 50 to 1 dynamic range here. But the big problem is that when you go in a sunny landscape, the dynamic range that you're really looking at is more like 100,000 to 1. So what's going on? Well, 
If I want to photograph and display the sunny landscape on my computer screen, I'm going to run into two problems, right? One is that, well, my display doesn't have as big a dynamic range as the scene I'm trying to draw, so I couldn't reproduce it 100% anyway. And even if I could, maybe this is a static image that I'd like your eye to digest. And just by reproducing it exactly, you may not actually get the visual effect that you're looking for. You might want to summarize the light and dark content in a scene in a way that's uh, digestible. So there's some cool image filtering techniques out there that try to help with these sorts of dynamic range issues. I thought I'd just highlight a few of them. So one really fun algorithm is designed to at least deal with the fact that a single uh, shutter speed may be not enough to capture all the nice visual content in a uh, complicated scene here. And so this technique is called exposure fusion. This was a popular idea to study in graphics maybe 10 years ago or so. Um, and still there's some algorithms out there that uh, exist today. So here's another church scene. <laughs> I did promise you there are going to be a lot of those. And the basic idea here is rather than just taking a single photograph, here we've taken four photographs. And then an image processing filter is used to essentially select between these different four photographs and fuse them together to create the final result. So some estimate of which exposure is best is computed at every single pixel, and then all the images are fused together. Now, exposure fusion is actually quite a challenging problem for a number of reasons. One is that every single pixel needs to automatically determine which exposure uh, to feature, and maybe you want to blur them together so that there's not like sharp edges. More importantly, uh, okay, so this nice static church scene is one thing, but what would happen if there were people in the church? Or, I don't know, somebody's playing basketball on the altar. I don't know if that's sacrilegious. Well, when they're moving objects, it's very unlikely that those four exposures that you took are going to align perfectly with one another. And so what can happen in the fused image is that you end up seeing ghosts of uh, <laughs> different uh, parts of your scene kind of overlaid with one another. And so oftentimes in exposure fusion, in addition to just selecting out pixel colors and the, nice, the kind of interesting color range, um, you also have to do some amount of alignment of the different uh, exposure uh, images, maybe even locally, before you can do that in a reasonable fashion. So anyway, there are all kinds of cool ideas in the computational photography world uh, built on these, these basic challenges. Um, another one might be to actually edit your camera technology or the way that you take photographs a little bit. So for example, um, one of the big challenges is that low light photography just in general can create a lot of noise in a final image. You know, if I take a, a photograph of a dimly lit room, you know, some romantic candle scene, there just aren't that many photons that are going into my camera. And so very often it'll look kind of grainy or noisy. Now, what's the best way to improve that situation? Well, one thing to do would be to attach a giant flash onto your camera, <laughs> you know, flash a big light onto your scene and then take a picture. But then you've lost the romantic uh, candlelit look in favor of getting nice sharp edges in your photograph. So one uh, technique which was proposed many years back was to do flash, no flash photography, <laughs> where essentially you take two pictures similar to exposure fusion. One is this grainy image that captures all the color that you want in your romantic candlelit scene. And then you take your flash image which has an you know, ugly washed out flash look, but has all the sharp edges that you want and you try to fuse those together. So anyway, there's been a massive amount of creativity in the uh, computational photography world that has led to these cool cameras that we all carry around in our pocket today on our phones. Yet another uh, version of this is uh, tone mapping. So we talked about exposure fusion, which is meant to cope with the fact that your camera uh, can't capture different parts of dynamic range all at once because you have to choose how long the, the, the uh, shutter is open. A different issue has to do with the display technology. 
right? If I'm trying to draw one of these churches on a matte sheet of paper, then I have a very different dynamic range to work with in my display device than if I put it on a computer screen or something else. And so this is the problem of tone mapping, where you're trying to map the colors that you measured from the real world onto a displayable range. Now, tone mapping algorithms can get a little too dramatic. So I think for a little while, we all were seeing these terrible skies in uh, tone mapped images. And if you look really closely here, you'll see an artifact of uh, some, some, what do you call it? Like kind of shadowing near uh, sharp edges. But really tone mapping is used uh, to try and saturate the visual, the visual range that you can get out of a given display device by mapping the uh, pixel colors in the image to the displayable range, which is different depending on your medium. Tone mapping is actually kind of a tricky problem, and it has to do with not just your medium, but also human perception. So the simplest thing that you could do would be to take the tone range that you see in a given image and just map it linearly to the tone range that your display device uh, can have. That often can make for scenes that look flat and dark. Now, why would that be? Well, a lecture or two ago, we talked about how the visual system works. And remember that, in fact, our eyes are really sensitive to ratios in intensity, right? That's what led us to define, for example, uh, gamma curves. And so really, uh, one of the sort of simple things uh, that we can do is rather than uh, do our tone mapping in image space, a very typical thing would be uh, instead to do it in logarithm space which can create, in effect, basically brighter, dark regions in an image, just making use of the fact that the tone mapping really shouldn't be mapping in a linear fashion, but rather kind of an exponential logarithmic one. Now, of course, real world tone mapping algorithms get much more complicated than this, but there's your basic trick for the day. If you want to do effective tone mapping, one thing you can do is take the log of your image, rescale that, to their, uh, dyna you know, the dynamic range that you can display and then exponentiate. So anyway, the really amazing thing is all of the filters that we've talked about so far in today's lecture are just per pixel filters. They're just a giant for loop over every pixel in the image doing some kind of editing on the pixel colors one by one. Of course, the sad fact or the exciting fact, <laughs> sorry, I should say fun fact, <laughs> is that most interesting filters involve more than one pixel at a time. And we've already seen many of those in 6837. So for example, probably the simplest one, which is running on our computers all the time, is to resize an image. So maybe here uh, your input is maybe this medium sized image and we can try to make it bigger or smaller. So here uh, is my mom's cat, and you can see even in this little itty bitty version, uh, we can still see uh, Samantha relatively well. Samantha's gained a lot of weight since we took this photograph. Hmm. <laughs> but that's okay. All right. And in fact, we've already seen algorithms for, in effect, doing image resizing, right? So when we talked about texture lookups, uh, in effect, remember that the texture was rarely the same size as the 3D rendered content, so we had to scale it up and down um, quite a bit. And so all of the same challenges when we were talking about texture mapping, mip maps, and so on, basically the same techniques apply and the same issues appear. Right. So for example, uh, one uh, typical image filter uh, does minification. Minification is a fancy word for making an image smaller. And the basic challenge here is that small distances become large. So here is a pretty small distance. <clears throat> and when I look back at the distance between these two points in the original input image to minification, notice that they're now over a much larger neighborhood. And so, you know, in order to carry out minification, well, maybe we have to integrate over a larger region or do some kind of averaging, right? And so we already talked in this class about what happens when you don't do that. Namely, if you just use like nearest neighbor interpolation, you're going to get aliasing, which is not so good. So instead, what do we do? Well, we take weighted averages of pixel colors. So maybe 
you know, if I look at a pixel here, then I actually view it as the average of the pixel colors in some region in the source image. And if uh, you want, this would be a good opportunity to pause and review that anti-aliasing lecture to remember the different filters that we can use for ideal sampling and reconstruction. So in particular, one of the best ways to get a nice minification uh, result might be to use some approximation of sync, which remember is the ideal reconstruction filter, uh, at least for a band limited image. Now, similarly uh, to minification, we can also talk about the opposite of that, which is magnification. So taking a small image and making it bigger. And in that case, the challenges were different because in some sense, we can't really add detail to an image where there isn't any. So the aliasing that we're getting is due more to an interpolation strategy than anything else. Um, so we talked about some different strategies for how to do magnification. Um, in particular, doing bilinear interpolation was our main strategy, where if we needed to look up colors in between pixels, we do it just by basically taking weighted averages of pixel colors nearby. That's actually not the end of the story, however. So there are some cool uh, advanced magnification techniques out in the literature. And now that deep learning is so popular, I'm sure there will be many more. And essentially what these techniques are trying to do is to represent the fact that photographs aren't totally arbitrary images. They tend to contain patterns that we all know and love, right? We tend to take photographs of things with sharp edges and very distinctive features. So one thing that you might try to do when you upsample or magnify an image is rather than just using bilinear filtering, that's like what you see at the top of the uh, slide here. Notice you get something fuzzy, which might be okay from like a Fourier anti-aliasing perspective, but doesn't look so great. And instead, maybe you just try to detect sharp image, uh, edges in the image and reconstruct them in a better fashion. Now, really, this is like making up content where there isn't any. Like, there's nothing from a signal processing perspective that says that the uh, reconstruction on the bottom should be better. But oftentimes, essentially by taking advantage of knowing something about the statistics of natural images out there in the universe, we can do better magnification than just bilinear. So anyway, I'll let you guys Google to uh, see other examples of that. Now, of course, sampling shows up all over the place, um, and you can do it in PowerPoint all day long. I had fun, you know, taking Samantha the cat here and growing her and shrinking her, rotating, stretching, all that good stuff. Um, in fact, um, I didn't even have to uh, do my sampling in a totally uniform fashion, right? So there are plenty of image uh, deformation techniques out there that do this in a local way. So I believe these images are produced using one technique called moving least squares, uh, which is one of the sort of basic graphics algorithms out there for doing... Uh, image style deformation. So now let's move on to a different type of image filter, which is also extremely common and one that we've already mentioned, and that's convolution. So the basic idea of convolution, which we sketched out very briefly when we talked about anti-aliasing, is that we're going to replace the color of a pixel with some weighted average of pixel colors nearby. So this little animation that I've borrowed from Wikipedia is one little illustration of what goes on when you do convolution. So here I'm convolving against a box filter. That's this little moving rectangle. So the idea is, for example, when I compute the color of that black pixel, or, oop, ah, that black function at some location like here, I center the box at that point, and then I take the average of that blue function within that box region, right? So you can understand convolution as sliding the filter along and taking weighted averages. So in this case, it's just as a uniform uh, average filter. That's what we're seeing here. So let's do this more generally. Oops, I'm realizing that my PowerPoint slide has kind of dark colors. Hopefully you can see um, we've got black here and gray here. Not sure why it looks so dark and our recording software, but that's okay. Let's say that I convolve it against this thing. So we might call this the uh, filter. Then behind the scenes, what is image convolution really doing? It's quite simple. 
what we're going to do is we're just going to take this convolution filter and kind of drop it on top of our image, then use that as a set of averaging weights to produce the output. So for example, here you can see that I've dropped my green convolution filter on top of the input image. And let's say that I want to compute the color of the pixel that I just circled here. Well, all I do is I weight uh, W-E-I-G-H-T, <laughs> the uh, colors in the input image by these green values. They're not actually green. These are just weights that sum up to one. And that's what I use for weighted average. So if I want to get the convolution image, well, I'm just going to take that averaging kernel is often what this is called, this little green guy, or filter is what I called it in the last slide. And I'm going to slide it along the image and fill in the colors one by one, right? So for these two pixels, notice that they're completely within the black region, so the output color is black. But now the green starts to straddle the darker and the lighter region, so the output color gets a little bit lighter. Admittedly, only a little bit because I'm afraid the colors on these slides are kind of bad. And so on as you move to the right. And so that's how we fill in our image. Now, really, this should get lighter Sorry that something's gone a little bit wrong with the PowerPoint here, but uh, I don't think it's worth pausing and trying to fix it. So there are uh, many common properties that we have for kernels. Typically they integrate or they sum to one because otherwise they just end up scaling up the input image. And they're usually relatively small relative to the image. Now in popular kind of neural network machine learning, these kernels are actually learned but even before we did that, um, oftentimes built into software like Photoshop, it's just a big library of convolution kernels that are useful for image processing. So here's some examples. So one is blurring. So here we have the Taj Mahal on the left-hand side. And if we convolve it using weights that look like this, we get a blurry Taj Mahal. This isn't surprising because essentially this looks like some bell curve uh, centered at the middle pixel here. A different thing you might do is actually have positive value in, in the center of your kernel and then my negative values on the outside. And what is this doing? Well, it's kind of comparing a pixel maybe to the average of the four colors nearby. So in flat regions of my image, I'll just get zero, right? Because there's basically no change. But where I'll see the change would be maybe along the edges in my photograph where the central pixel is quite different from the average of its neighbors. And so here you can see that this is some very simple edge detection filter. Another kind of fun one that you see a lot in 1980s videos is embossing. <laughs> this was an effect that I think was intended to make it look like your video was somehow punched out of a piece of uh, tin foil or something, where in this case you have a negative lobe and a positive lobe kind of interacting with one another. Now, the big challenge for convolution uh, computationally is that it's quite expensive. So here's an algorithm for actually computing the convolution of an image against a kernel. So here, my image is some n by n grid of numbers. My kernel is some m by m grid of numbers. So what do I do? Well, I can loop over every pixel in the image I'm trying to produce. And now I have to loop over every pixel in the convolution kernel and take that weighted average. So if I compute the big O runtime of this algorithm, well, the first term here is due to the fact that I have to compute n squared pixels in my image. The second term here is due to the fact that to compute a single pixel in my image, I need to convolve against an m by m kernel. And so the runtime scales pretty poorly, you know, cortically in some sense. So there are faster techniques out there, and we'll talk about one or two of them today. So to give you some idea of the uh, flavor for typical techniques for doing fast convolution, I thought I'd really motivate it based on one of the uh, really important kernels that we uh, convolve against, and that's just a Gaussian or bell curve. So remember that oftentimes we use bell curves as a really coarse approximation of sync or just a good way to do sampling and reconstruction. So the filter that we're going to try and convolve against is this green guy here, 
which is just basically a weighted average that's centered at the middle. So Gaussian convolution essentially is convolving against a kernel that looks something like e to the minus distance squared, scaled to integrate to one. Typically we use a relatively small neighborhood um, and this is a positive kernel. It also has one additional really nice property, which we'll examine uh, in just a moment, which is that it's separable. Now, separable kernels are really cool. So the basic idea here is that if I convolve against a kernel that looks like a Gaussian, that's actually the same as carrying out two convolutions. Basically, I can blur my image horizontally, and then I can blur my image vertically, and you can prove that that is equivalent to blurring out the entire uh, image all in one shot. Now, why does that matter? Well, essentially what it means is that now I've reduced my algorithm from n squared m squared for Gaussian convolution down to n squared m by doing it horizontally and then vertically, right? Now I only have to worry about one dimensional filtering instead of two dimensional filtering. It also means that I only really have to be good at doing one dimensional Gaussian filtering. So again, in case I've lost you, basically my point for the next few minutes is just to talk about blurring against one very important kernel, this Gaussian kernel, which just looks like a big bump centered in the middle. Um, and that's because blurring shows up just about everywhere in image processing. So just for fun, to give you a bit of a flavor of the kinds of things that we can do to do one dimensional Gaussian convolution, um, let's actually motivate one little theorem that you may have seen in statistics. This is kind of a remarkable fact. It's one that you can test experimentally very easily, even if you've never proved it before in a math class. Very roughly, what this theorem says, this is the central limit theorem, is that I can apply any reasonable positive kernel, so like a positive kernel that sums up to one to an image, and if I do it enough times, the result is going to start to look like Gaussian convolution. It's going to start looking like convolution against that bell curve function. So let's actually do an experiment here. So here's a box. <laughs> um, and let's say that I convolve that box against another box. What I'll end up getting is this red triangle function that you see on the screen here. By the way, I'm including a Gaussian, this blue curve, just for reference. You know, it's pretty easy to convince yourself that the convolution of a box against itself is uh, basically a triangle shape. Now, if I take that function and I convolve it against another Gaussian, I'll get actually something piecewise quadratic and so on. So if I keep going more and more, take a look at the magic that happens. The more times I convolve against just a box, the more my filter ends up looking like a Gaussian. Now, here's the really clever thing. Convolving an image against the box filter is super easy because what am I doing? I'm just taking a row of pixels and I'm like replacing maybe the color at the central pixel with the average of the pixel colors nearby. And there's a really clever trick for convolving against a box which is, let's say that I've computed the value of the convolution of the box at this pixel, and now I want the convolution of the box against the next pixel. Well, one thing I can do is just subtract off the leftmost one and add on the rightmost one and keep kind of a moving average as I move along the image. And so when I do that, what I get is a particularly simple algorithm for just blurring an image against this really simple box filter. So a box was not the Gaussian that we wanted, but rather just convolving against this kind of a function. But now if I apply this multiple times, then by the central limit theorem, what I'll get is something that looks Gaussian. So in any event, this is a super simple algorithm for approximate Gaussian convolution. I just thought it'd be kind of fun to mentioned in this class. Then we'll get back to our high-level discussion. The two basic points are one, to take advantage of the uh, separability of the Gaussian uh, filter by blurring in X and then in Y. This shaves off a factor. The other one 
is that you can do your one dimensional blur in really, really efficient fashion, basically just passing over your image one time by using a box filter rather than convolving against the Gaussian, but just applying that box K times instead of one time. So anyway, if you didn't get that, it's no big deal. These are just the kinds of signal processing tricks that we do to try and shave off computation uh, uh, when we're doing things like convolution. Okay, uh, and in fact, there are many different strategies. So for instance, another one that I'm not gonna mention is something called the uh, Gaussian pyramid, which uh, is essentially a strategy where instead of doing convolution, you kind of average up and down a hierarchy. Now, stepping back again uh, 10 feet and, and just talking about image processing broadly, one of the really interesting things that we often find is that the details really, really matter when we derive image filters. And so you often see software like Photoshop and other image processing tools being uh, really, really carefully engineered to avoid introducing artifacts in photographs. Otherwise, you can get some really funny things that happen. So, for instance, here uh, is a photograph of a dog. And just for fun, um, we've taken this photograph of a dog and we've rotated it 30 degrees 12 times. Right. So, of course, that takes the dog and it rotates it in a full circle. Now, I'm not going to worry about boundary conditions. So, when I rotate the image... I end up, you know, with a pixel grid that, you know, cuts off the corners. And so we're just going to put in black. We're not going to worry about it. So that's what's going on here. But more importantly, focus on the uh, image of the dog itself. So every time that I rotate the dog, I actually introduce a little bit of error. Hopefully you guys see that. That essentially, like for example, maybe I use a bilinear filter. So when I rotate the dog by 30 degrees, I often end up having to kind of look backward into the insides of pixels and do some interpolation to uh, get the final color. And so when I rotate the dog 30 degrees 12 times, I get an image which is an approximation of the input dog. But by virtue of each of those rotation filters, I've actually accumulated a tiny, tiny bit of error. So let's take our experiment and let's make it even more detailed. So maybe instead I rotate it five degrees, 72 times. Now take a close look at like the grass behind this dog. And you'll see that already something weird is starting to happen. Or now let's rotate it one degree, 360 times. Oh boy. <laughs> so what happened here? Well, this is just a great example where the details of your image filtering really, really matter um, down to the last little bit. So, and, and sometimes the uh, filters that are ideal for like one rotation can introduce particular species of error that might be problematic for chaining a bunch of operations together. So for example, here is uh, one kind of common replacement for um, by linear interpolation, which actually does a better job. It's called the Lonzo 3 filter. But it does have this funny property that it dips a bit above 100%. So the weighted average that it takes um, actually ends up with weights that are smaller than zero and greater than one, just by a tiny bit. So what ends up happening when we do all of these uh, rotations is that, well, the fact that the rubber is meeting the road and we're not really doing true signal processing. Everything is an approximation. In particular, that nice anti-aliasing sample and reconstruction story doesn't quite hold. It begins to accumulate uh, and eventually the high frequencies in the image here uh, ended up getting um, accentuated in a bad way. In any event, once we can just do things like blurring and resampling, there are all kinds of other filters that we can define. So here's another common one called the unsharp mask. Unsharp mask gets a bit used and abused, I think, in amateur photography, but that's okay. So if this operation is convolving against a Gaussian, remember that's just fancy words for uh, blurring a photograph out, then the uh, unsharp mask does a kind of interesting thing, which is it takes the original image minus the blurred out image, and it actually kind of scales it up. So the idea here is that, like, so for example, when beta is equal to 1, 
you know, so when beta is equal to one, you get the original image, right? Because here you'll have uh, the blurred out guy plus the original one minus the blurred out guy. But then when beta is bigger than one, what do you get? Well, it actually accentuates the edges. And so essentially the uh, unsharp mask here can be used for these dramatic effects where maybe I take our cat and I want to accentuate the cat against the background. So I'm gonna brighten it, especially when there's some contrast. Or here on the left, you see another kind of, I would argue, kind of overdone <laughs> unsharp mask where you can see that especially around the sharp edges there's artifacts where the blurred out version of her lips is making the difference with her skin uh, uh, accentuated or here's a clear illustration of what's going on um, I think this is something called a, a halo artifact where we took an image which originally was just two shades of gray but by applying the unsharp mask, you're sharpening, you're not really sharpening the edges, but you're accentuating them by amplifying the difference between the image and a blurred out version in the background. This, art, this is called a halo artifact. So here's another kind of blown out, uh, over-processed photograph. Now, convolution uh, is basically a linear image filter. Now, we've already talked about so many different linear things in 6837. Convolution is no different. If I convolve, you know, A times image 1 plus B times image 2 against some filter, then convolution um, is, is, uh, distributes out in a linear fashion. So that's the same as convolving image 1 against the filter, convolving image 2 against the filter, and then adding together the results. But that's only the beginning of the story for image filtering. Um, and in fact, in computational photography, many of the cool filters that are out there are nonlinear, uh, in which case they cannot, in fact, provably be written as, as simple convolution. Um, so for example, one of the big issues in Gaussian filtering is that all the edges are lost in your photograph, essentially just blurring everything out. So one simple solution might be to take that Gaussian kernel and to modify it. So one of the really popular techniques for doing that is to use something called the bilateral filter. The bilateral filter says that pixels should be nearby if they're nearby in both space, like along the image, as well as intensity. So that way, if I filter some input image, so here the image is being rendered as kind of a height above the image plane. So what is this, this image of? It's kind of like a bunch of light pixels and then a bunch of dark pixels, but the pixel colors themselves are a little noisy. Um, essentially, what the bilateral filter does is it attempts to take that Gaussian and rather than just putting like a giant filter on top of everything, cut off the tails where the uh, colors don't match up. So maybe here your, your filter would actually look something like that. So, um, Applying filters like the bilateral is extremely complicated mathematically. Um, it turns out you need some clever algorithms for doing this sort of thing, but practically it can have a very serious effect. So here is an example of bilateral filtering. You can see uh, when I apply a Gaussian filter to my input image, it just ends up blurry. When I apply bilateral filter, essentially like the pixels on her face get mixed together with other pixels on her face but they don't get mixed together with like the grass behind her because that's a very different intensity. So anyway, in like 10 seconds or less, this is one simple example of a nonlinear filter. There are so many others. Um, another common one is the median filter, which replaces every pixel with the median of the pixel colors in some neighborhood. This is one that I think you guys could all implement at home very easily. Um, medium filter is interesting because it's robust, so it's it's not very sensitive to noise and can be used to filter out um, some bad artifacts or even fill in missing pixels where there aren't any, like what we show on the right hand side. So in any event, here's our quick recap for the day. Essentially image processing can be used to touch up images after rendering in addition to being used to process photographs and everything else. The very, very basics of image processing involve lots of just 
per pixel filtering and that allowed us to do some pretty impressive stuff really everything from compositing an alpha to saturating an image to dealing with high dynamic range by fusing multiple exposures together um, or you know remapping the tones in the image using the logarithmic scale then we talked a little bit about filters that use larger neighborhoods and nonlinearities. So convolution is the very simple one where I take an image and I convolve it against a filter by taking weighted averages of pixels nearby. For fun, I attempted, I probably failed, but I attempted to uh, sketch out one particularly important convolution, which is against a Gaussian filter. That's just a bell curve, maybe an X and Y. And the Gaussian is really important because it's used to just blur stuff out. Once we have blurring, we can do not just blurring, but also things like the unsharp mask, which actually, in some sense, are accentuating the high frequency content. Then finally, in the last couple of minutes, we talked about some nonlinear filters, like edge preserving filtering, median filtering, and so on. These kinds of filters are more complex pieces of code that require doing specialized operations per pixel, but they can have really interesting effects like filling in mixing pixel colors. That's like one of the applications of the median filter or blurring out an image while preserving its sharp edges like what the bilateral filter does. In any event, today's lecture is just intended as sort of a sketch of some of the basic techniques in this area. Image processing is a really fun area to work in because the code tends not to be super hard to write, at least for the basics. And uh, you can really go wild with deriving different image filters and coming up with creative ways to take in a photograph and make it have a nice, interesting look, right? So I think we see that reflected in a lot of the photography apps that you have on your phone these days. So in any event, this is just to give you a quick idea of this particular area, and I encourage you to dig more. There's an entire computational photography course here at MIT that covers this content in far more detail. But with that, uh, we'll see you next time.